I want you to think about, um, for those of you that went to church yesterday, and even for those that didn't, what did you do while you were there? Uh, what is the real biblical purpose of church? Why did God design it? A lot of people have different ideas of what the church is to be about, what you're supposed to do when you go there. And I want to just straighten out that confusion right now because in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is going to make it really clear how God expects his church to function. And if you take the average church today and compare it to what it says here, you're, you're wondering, what are they doing? What is really going on in these churches? You know, why have they adopted that kind of model that doesn't resemble anything of what the Bible says? Okay, so uh, I'm going to make this really clear, uh, pay very close attention. But let me show you something first before we even get started. I'm going to, hopefully you can see this, okay? What I've done is diagram the passage we're going to look at, and that's in Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. And what this is, is a visual uh, picture of the breakdown of the passage in Ephesians, which tells us why God gave certain gifts, what they're for, how they're supposed to be used, and what the end goal is. Okay? And let me just read this to you. We'll start in verse 11. And we're, and, and we're speaking, Paul is speaking of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And he says this, And he, being the Holy Spirit, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Okay, so if you remember the chart I had done before on the foundation of the church. The foundation of the church, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. But he's not just the cornerstone, he's also the head of the church. To build that foundation, God enlisted both prophets and apostles. They were needed in order to usher in the transition of God working specifically in a church as opposed to working in the nation of Israel. Once that was done and the word of God was completed, the gifts and the office of apostle and prophets cease. Okay, so yeah, a lot of prophets running around today calling themselves prophets. And all. Do you realize that in the Old Testament... The test for a true prophet that if they said one thing, one little letter wrong, they were to be stoned to death. I hear all these so-called prophets today that put prophet before their name and all that, and they're trying to claim what they heard from God and give some kind of divine revelation and all that. They'd all be stoned to death. Okay? I think back in the 60s, there was a woman by the name of Dixon or something that used to give fortune telling. And she had better accuracy than many of these prophets. But the, pro the gift of prophecy was necessary in order to usher in that transition. Once that was done, it was done. Apostles, uh, that it was done. That they, the church is built on the foundation. Okay, J Jesus the cornerstone, and you have apostles, and you have prophets. Now, we got something else. That was complete. Now we've got to go to another stage. And here's where we get into the purpose of the church. And so let me read it again to you. For the foundation. And he gave some as apostles and some prophets. And then he says this. He goes on to the next stage. And some evangelists. And some pastors and teachers. Pastors and teachers go together. Okay. So after you have the foundation... Then you have evangelists, which is necessary for salvation. Foundation, salvation. Then comes the third stage, and that's pastors and teachers. And listen to this, edification. What does edification mean? 
It means the building up of one another. Listen, when I, when I went in the army, it's not that difficult to understand. When I went in the army, everybody goes through basic training. Okay, you learn uh, Army 101 or whatever it is, Marine, Navy, Air Force, okay. Uh, the same thing is true with Christianity. First of all, you've got to learn your ABCs of Christianity, basic Bible doctrine. Uh, and, but also, this is a part which is very neglected, and that is, what is your spiritual gift? You should know what it is, and it should be trained. Okay, and I'll get to that more in a minute. You won't find that in the public school. In fact, the very mention of having spiritual gifts in a public school is considered foolish. You know, yesterday they had a big thing on the news of the head of the public schools making a big rant. And her basic idea was not to teach fundamental, you know, things like math and English and grammar and history and all that, but to program kids to be a more ecumenical, all-inclusive a group of people. I wouldn't send my kids to public schools. In fact, I didn't. But if you got your kids in public schools, they're programming them, okay? They're desensitizing them to truth, and, and instead, they are doing brainwashing in them, and that's why you got all these young kids and these young people doing the things they're doing, because that's the way they were orientated, you know? And so, he gave some prophets and apostles, Jesus being the cornerstone, he's the head of the church. He's got a direction for the church. I want you to think about your church yesterday. Okay, just think about that for a minute. He gave some as pastors and teachers. That's for edification, building up. Okay, and then he gives the purpose in the very next verse for the perfecting or the equipping of the saints unto the work of ministering. So, the, the Bible makes it really clear that once you become a Christian, you are a saint. You are a high priest. You don't need to wear really a clerical collar. You are a priest before God. But God gives us different gifts. So like when I went in the army, you get your basic training. But then they send you to what's called AIT, Advanced Individual Training. Okay, mine was recon, 11 Delta. Okay, from there you go to either your base or you even take more training. I went to more training, I went to jump school in Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay, they give you then what's called an MOS. That is your job description for, why, for, for the time that you're in the Army. Okay, so mine was recon. Okay, I was a scout. Now, your MOS defines who you are and what you do. Well, the Holy Spirit does the same thing with us. At the moment we're saved, he gives us an MOS. He gives us a gift. So you take your basic training, right? Then you get your advanced individual training. You discover what your spiritual gifts are that the Holy Spirit gave you the minute you were saved. And then you get equipped in it. And that's what it says here. He gave pastors and teachers to equip the saints, equip you and me. And then he says, unto the work of ministering. Who does the work of ministry? The saints that were equipped, not the pastor. They're the ones that do the equipping. See, a lot of people get it all wrong. Uh, you know, they hire this pastor and they expect him to go doing visitation and doing all these priestly duties like marrying and bearing and all that stuff and, uh, and bring a message and all that. They give this job description to this pastor to so foreign to the Bible. The Bible says the pastor's job and the teacher's job is to equip the saints. So he gets them around and he trains them. Now you all go out and do ministry. My job is to train. Yours is to do ministry. Now, I have a gift of teaching. Okay? Uh, that gift has been trained. It's been equipped over many years uh, under uh, godly teachers and so forth. That's my gift. Your gift may be different. Okay? Maybe you have a gift of evangelism, but it's still, it needs to be trained. It needs to be de developed. Your spiritual gifts need to be, whatever they are, grow into maturity. 
Okay, as I was explaining uh, yesterday, let's say you have a gift of mercy, okay? And, but you, you're very immature in that gift. The gift of mercy is to relieve someone of pain or their distress, okay? To bring them comfort and encouragement. Well, let's say that God brought a trial on this person because of disobedience or maybe because he's trying to train them in something, uh, you know, and you come along with this gift without maturity, don't recognize what God is doing in this person's life and relieve him of the very thing God put him into. That's an irresponsible and immature way of using your spiritual gift. So you have to use discernment and wisdom, no different than the gift of giving. Let's say I have the gift of giving, okay, and I see that you have a need. But in my gift of giving, I don't have anything to give because I'm broke all the time. I don't work and I don't do anything. So I'm going to be frustrated in my gift because I have nothing to give. So your, your, your gift has to be not only developed, but it has to be established with various resources. I have a gift of teaching, so I got hundreds of books. I do a lot of studying. Okay, I compare, I, I, I compare one thing with another so that it all fits. Study to make yourself approved so the word of God fits, not becomes disjointed. Well, this doesn't make sense with this. Okay, I wouldn't be a very good teacher then. So the job of the pastor teachers is to equip the saints. Now, you need to recognize two things the church. There's two concepts of the church in the New Testament. There is the body of Christ, which is that invisible body that only God knows who is really his and whose isn't. Okay, we can compare it with the tares and the wheat. Okay, that's the body. That's the bride. Those are those possessing Christ, the Holy Spirit, not the professing, those that are just being religious. I know a lot of people are religious. They go to church and they do this. They've been doing the same thing for years. They don't even know what they're doing. Okay? <laughs> it doesn't resemble anything what the New Testaments are. Then there's the local body. That's the organized assembly of believers that have... Uh, a function in there. They got leadership. They got administration, which is a gift, and, and they have a particular purpose, or they'll have a stated purpose. And they're, you know, we exist for this reason, and we do these things. Okay. Uh, so you got your universal church, and then you got your local assembly. In your local assembly, you're going to have people with varying gifts. Okay. So let me read this to you again. And he gave some as apostles and prophets for the foundation, some evangelists for salvation, pastors and teachers for edification, for the equipping of the saints. If you are in the military, once in a while they'll send you to the armory. An armory is a place where you get equipped. You get your weapons, you get rested, uh, you get advanced training, okay, so when you come into the church, it's like coming into an armory, okay, or a life ship, not a cruise ship, <laughs> and that's where your wounds get healed, that's where your broken bones get mended, this is where you get equipped, trained, mended, rested up, restored, okay, it says, onto the work of ministry, onto the building of the body of Christ. Now, now it's going to give the time frame. Till we attain unto the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. So you're growing unity and knowledge. What was Paul's ambition? That they may know Christ and all his power and all his suffering. Okay, it was a growing, uh, 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 I think the Greek word is, is um, gnosko. It's an intimate knowledge of getting to know God in a personal way. If I was to ask you right now, give me one word of what you think about God. What would you tell me? And different people would say different things. I think he's holy, he's perfect, he's immutable, uh, he's transcendent, uh, he's omniscient, he's omnipotent. You know, he's loving, he's kind, he's compassionate. 
and you're beginning to describe God as you have come to know him personally. Okay? Until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a full-grown man, until the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So it doesn't end. This equipping goes on until you die. There is no point in the Christian life where you say, well, you know, I arrive, I can sit back, I don't need to learn anymore. You know, you're going to grow and grow and grow and grow. And if you don't, you're going to be like a car on a hill. The minute you start growing, you're going to start sliding back. Okay, and I see a lot of people like that, you know, and they call them what? Carnal, um, backslidden, <laughs> backsliding all the way back. <laughs> you know, I saw a picture of okay. <laughs> this woman parked her car on a hill and she forgot to put it in park. And next thing you know, she didn't even realize. She closed the door, she gets out of the car, starts sliding down and it's heading into a riverbank. <laughs> the car went down into the river. She's chasing after it like she's going to stop it. It was so funny. But anyway, that's what happens in the Christian life. We start, we need to keep moving on. What happens when you get up to a steep hill? Especially for us that are a little older. The, the, the higher we go, the steeper it is, the more effort it takes. Uh, you know? And if any of you ever done any hiking, you know when you climb a, a ridge and you think you're finally at the top, and when you get to the top of the ridge, you look, oh, there's another one. <laughs> the, the life, the Christian life, doesn't get easier, it gets harder. But you also learn to give it over to Christ, and he carries you. Okay, that is the secret. You know, it's learning how to pass your load on. And Jesus says, take my load, it's easy. It's learning how to do that and then letting Christ go ahead and push you up that mountain. Okay, until, until the measure of the stature of the of fullness of Christ. And here's why, especially today, that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every one of doctrine, by the slate of man in craftiness under the wiles of error. And that's what happens to a lot. I see it every day. They're in the day that goes, I can go right now on Facebook and point out this era, this era, there. And you have Christians promoting this era, this era, this era, this era. This era. They've never been trained. They hear something, that, oh, it excites them, they pass it on to somebody else without doing the research or the study, or not having the, the background of, of deep spiritual wisdom and revelation and study in order to recognize something that's false. Okay, you want to know, you want to point out a counterfeit $100 bill? Well, you got to compare it to the genuine thing. But if you don't know the genuine thing, you're going to be taken by surprise. You got a lot of these so-called prophets and apostles and um, mega preachers out there that are promoting a gospel and things that is foreign to the scriptures. They're doing services or what they call worship services with all this contemporary music and jumping around and all that. That has nothing to do with what the Bible teaches here. Okay? So you need to understand the true picture of God's design for how, what he wants for the church. And then he goes on to say, we're to grow up in all things in the Him." Who is the head? Even Christ. Christ is the head of the church, uh, from whom the body fitly framed and knit together through that which every joint, according to the work and in due measure of each part, make it the increase of the body until the building of itself in love. See, when the church functions the way God intends it, and Christ being the cornerstone, you have the foundation, you got the evangelists, you got the pastors and teachers, then you got all the various uh, Christians uh, with all their gifts, and there's a number of gifts that are still inoperative today, and they're all being fitted together for that one glorious body of Christ. So I asked you at the beginning, what did you do in church yesterday? Did it have anything to do with being equipped? Did, it, did you come away with something where you're now more prepared to do uh, and use the gift that God has given you? Did you also use your gift in that assembly to help others? Okay, that is the purpose of church. You come collectively together, 
mutually edify one another, then you go out and you do works of service, ministry. Who does the ministry? The people in the church. They go out, they reach people, they evangelize, they bring them back in the church, they get equipped to reproduce. You go to 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul told Timothy, find faithful people who are able to teach others also. And you communicate to them the things I communicated to you. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 28. Go into all the world and make disciples. He didn't say to make evangelists. He said disciple, a follower of Christ. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Everything that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. To teach them, equip them, train them. Build them up so that they can come to unity, not fragment it, disjoin it, frustrate it, uh, confuse Christians that are leaving the church in droves because they don't understand the real purpose of it. Okay, that's it for today. Hey, the hurricane missed us. I hope you're safe. I think it's headed up north, you know, up towards Galveston. Uh, but you all be safe. God bless you all. Read Ephesians, diagram it, do what you need to do, get involved with your church, find out what your spiritual gift is. You ought to know what it is. Uh, some have one, some have more, and then start getting it trained and start using it to build up other believers. God bless you all. You all have a great day. Bye-bye.